Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Marcella Echeverry, Assistant Professor of History at Yale University. She is an interdisciplinary scholar with a background in anthropology and political theory. Professor Echeverry's research and teaching interests focus on the relationship between political subjectivities and social transformation in Latin America from colonial times to the present. Today we talk with her about her forthcoming book, Indian and Black Royalists in the Age of Revolutions, Empire and Politics in the Northern Andes, 1780-1825. Welcome, Professor Echeverry. Thank you. Well, let's um, begin with an overview of your book. Tell us about it. So the book, as you just said, is focused on the uh, 1780 to 1825 period, mm -hmm. which uh, falls squarely within the Age of Revolutions, which is a moment when uh, most of the Atlantic world is in upheaval, mm -hmm. and there's uh, transformations in the political systems uh, of what at that moment were uh, col colonies of the um, European empires. Okay. And so basically, I look at the uh, Latin American wars of independence, so mm -hmm. essentially the moment when uh, Spain is being rejected uh, by people across uh, what at that time were the colonies, but of course we have to think about the fact that these were not yet the nations that we think about today. Okay. So I focus on uh, what is Colombia today, but was called New Granada at that time. Okay. Specifically, the southwestern region of this um, viceroyalty of New Granada, where there were important numbers of indigenous people and uh, African descendant people who were enslaved, and also some of them free. Mm -hmm. uh, so. During the independence wars, this becomes a region where most of the people mobilize in favor of the Spanish crown. Mm -hmm. uh, so particularly, interestingly, not in favor of the independence cause. Okay. Um, I look at why this happened. So the guiding question of my book is how to explain why indigenous people and people of African descent who we would normally expect to be uh, against the empire or to have anti-colonial interests are actually acting uh, in favor of the empire and in favor of the monarchy. Okay. Uh, and the way that I do this is by, as I said, I don't begin in the 1809 moment when the wars of independence actually begin, but I go back in time into the colonial period uh, and I look at how exactly the political relations and the political identities of these people, uh, indigenous people, people of African descent, both free and enslaved, were framed within the Spanish monarchy and the Spanish empire. Okay. So this is the first pa part of the book and it's actually um, then followed by the core of the manuscript which focuses on the independence wars and that's the part when, where I uh, look at more how the contingency throughout the wars is going to affect the positioning of these people as royalists mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the independence process. Um, so essentially the book is contributing to a number of fields because it's looking at indigenous people and people of African descent in, in the same frame, which is not very usual for uh, Latin American history and uh, Atlantic history more broadly. And it also really rethinks the politics of indigenous people and people of African descent mm -hmm. in the context of the age of revolutions. Okay. Um, what led you to write the book? So as you said, I have a background in anthropology and political theory, so I had already been quite interested in uh, discourses or notions about otherness in uh, Latin America. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the moment of the independence process becomes really crucial for understanding how we think about the role of uh, uh, what today are mostly minorities in, in, in Latin American nations in the construction of the nation state. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, reading a lot and thinking a lot about how to incorporate these people into these narratives of nation state formation. But uh, I came across the interesting and by all means paradoxical case of these royalists in southwestern New Granada. And uh, there were always mentions on, of them, but generally just by passing, there was no real problematization or even attempt to explain it. Um, 
they emerged uh, first of all I during the 19th century in the context of the independence wars mm -hmm. when uh, Simon Bolivar who uh, you know most of the people have heard about because he was quite important in uh, finalizing the the independence of uh, the South American uh, region and so he was trying to go south into Peru to to do uh, a, a co to have a connection with the um, southern independence mm -hmm. uh, movement and he was precisely blocked in this region that I study in the, the, the Popayan region uh, and the southwest of Colombia because the royalists were so uh, prominent and mm -hmm. so successful uh, for so long between 1809 and, and the 1820s and so again I was looking at how these royalists were uh, portrayed in the mm -hmm. uh, nationalist narratives written in the 19th century and usually you would find uh, references to the fact that they had been quite backward or that they were somewhat fanatical in, in religious terms, mm -hmm. that they were really not able to kind of grapple the situation and the opportunities they, that the, uh, obviously the anti-colonial movements were uh, posing or finding. Mm -hmm. And so this for me was completely insufficient and mm -hmm. uh, interestingly I didn't only find these types of explanations in the uh, 19th century literature but I started to see it, how uh, it reverberated somehow in the contemporary understandings that scholars handle uh, about, um, again, minorities, uh, ethnic minorities who are sometimes uh, thought to have a certain type or, or s scholars, historians, social scientists expect them to have a certain type uh, of political uh, identity or political mm -hmm. consciousness. And so what I'm referring to more specifically is, for example, there are like two sides of this debate. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, thinking about indigenous people or people of African descent being naturally anti-colonial, like I was saying before, that's mm -hmm. why people would normally expect them to be on the uh, insurgent side. Uh, or some people, even the 19th century scholars would say, well, definitely, we can expect them to be royalists, we can expect them to be in favor of the crown precisely because they are so backward mm -hmm. and uh, their political consciousness is so insufficient and so uh, unsophisticated, if you will, mm -hmm. that then that explains uh, everything uh, and that would be where the two sides mm -hmm. were. And for me, this became an incredible opportunity to revisit uh, the historical moment and mm -hmm. to think about the process from the point of view of the historical actors. And at the same time, I would be contributing, of course, to the literature and to our thinking about nation state formation, uh, about colonial history uh, more broadly, and of course, about the politics and the political mm -hmm. consciousness of uh, the popular classes right. in Latin America and the Atlantic world. Okay, um, very interesting. I uh, would love for you to tell us, you know, what you found when you examined the period prior to the, the um, independence um, in terms of, you know, what did you find about the people? How do you explain their embrace of Spain versus, versus not embracing? Yeah, that's a great question and that's exactly where the whole story begins mm -hmm. and where my methodological approach becomes important. And yes, I am going to ask you how you did your research too, <laughs> so by all means. So should I move into that one already? Whatever, however okay. you'd like to approach it. Because um, part of the, the point here is that because we are thinking from the present point of view, mm -hmm. we tend to already assume the way that things are going to sure. evolve, right? Yeah. So one of the challenges that uh, I myself have to be reminded of, but also that is the conclusion of how this project has evolved, is that when we go back in time, we're, we're, we don't know that outcome and we can actually think about uh, the process in a more open-ended way, mm -hmm. right? So what I'm trying to get to here is that perhaps we shouldn't talk about this in terms of why they didn't embrace the independence movement because that is assuming that the independence movement in itself exists as something given mm -hmm. uh, when the moment actually begs uh, uh, the possibility that these things were much more um, incoherent, uh, that uh, ideologies were not as clear-cut as we tend to sure. want to remember them and reconstruct them. So this was happening not only in the royalist uh, side, but also in the in independence or in insurgent side, right? Mm -hmm. And this is something that, of course, has been 
quite uh, well developed recently in the historiography as a whole, uh, trying to rethink um, the independence movement, perhaps by questioning the possibility that these people were envisioning independence from the beginning of, let's say, 1808, 1809. Mm -hmm. That obviously leaves open the possibility of thinking about the royalists in the same terms, how they envisioned transformations within the monarchy and within the empire. Mm -hmm. And so um, by looking at the colonial, late colonial context, and here we're talking about 1780s, which is already, uh, as I said before, within the age of revolutions, which means that there's already incredible transformations taking place mm -hmm. um, in, in the hemisphere. Nonetheless, um, what I'm trying to get to is how the political identities and the legal identities of, of these people, indigenous people, uh, enslaved and, and free people of African descent, are really um, in dialogue mm -hmm. uh, with the monarchical framework. So that means that it's very hard for them to uh, necessarily envision something uh, outside because what they're doing is actually uh, having a dialogue, having a, a conversation within the possibilities that, that they have at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, so in terms of how I, I did the, uh, the research, this is also important because um, the fact that, that indigenous people and people of African descent were generally excluded from narratives of independence and modern state formation, uh, modernization more broadly in Latin America, has to do with the fact that they are relatively absent uh, as voices, as explicit voices, producers of documents mm -hmm. in the sources that us historians use uh, to do our research, of right. course. It's an incredible challenge and for a long time people used this argument to actually, um, let's say, comfortably exclude them mm -hmm. from the narrative. <clears throat> but uh, of course this has been a challenge and transform and it has been a, an object of incredible uh, epistemological reflection among scholars and so what I did was basically use documents that were not produced by these uh, subjects by, by indigenous people or by people of African descent but that of course reflected some of their uh, actions and some of their um, positioning throughout the war and, and throughout uh, the late colonial period and that when they're read creatively you can actually get to important elements uh, of, of uh, their importance mm -hmm. during uh, the process. So I'm thinking mostly, uh, of course, letters, okay. uh, sermons, correspondence between uh, colonial officials and military officials because uh, something crucial that I have to explain here is that I've been interested both in the legal dimension of, of this process, so mm -hmm. in other words, as I said before, how the legal identities of indigenous people, free people uh, and, and slaves are um, constructed within the monarchical context. But I'm also very interested, especially in the independence wars, in the process of uh, the rise of uh, military opportunities for them to become, of course, political actors mm -hmm. uh, in the whole context of the war. Okay. So that's why um, military documents also became crucial and I did my research uh, in Spain, in Ecuador, because um, the archives that hold uh, documents for this region of, of southwestern Colombia are actually in, in Quito. Uh, also the John Carter Brown Library here in, in Providence, Rhode Island, mm -hmm. um, and, and of course Colombia, Bogota. Okay, so when you were doing your research did you come any across anything that surprised you that you weren't anticipating or perhaps expecting? Yes, and it's interesting because it has to do precisely with the challenges that the project posed for myself mm -hmm. uh, as much as I wanted to really break out of some of the most uh, limiting preconceptions about uh, these people and about uh, the region. I, it took some time to realize, for example, that I had to completely strip away this, uh, this topic and, and particularly the, the, the people that I was studying in southwestern New Granada of their connection with New Granada's center, which is Santa Fe, mm -hmm. because Santa Fe is going to very early on uh, start to uh, experiment with independence and autonomous rule. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
so if I continue to frame the story within the Colombian history, which is ultimately where it today still stands, right? Because we tend to project back uh, Colombia, mm -hmm. the country, the region, uh, the geography, into the past. And of course, that would lead to think maybe I'm writing Colombian history mm -hmm. of the 19th century. Right. But in fact, uh, that became a, a huge obstacle for me to really understand the dynamics of these royalist people. And uh, uh, eventually I ended up making the connection with actually the South, which is the Peruvian vice royalty that okay. remained as a royalist stronghold pretty much until, uh, I was telling you before, until Simon Bolivar finally is able to cross South and basically disarticulate this uh, very strong um, Spanish stronghold. Uh, but throughout the time of the, of the wars of independence, Popayán, the region that I, that I look at, is actually tied to Peru. And, and that really explains why it's able to maintain itself both politically and militarily during the war. Mm -hmm. So it really entailed breaking away from the, from the framework of colonial history completely and entirely to start to think about the royalists really in, in a more positive and creative way instead of thinking about them in the framework of colonial uh, history that is relatively based on a uh, negative perspective mm -hmm. that, they are, that these people are anti-Colombian, anti uh, right, anti-Republican. Uh, try to think about them beyond that mm -hmm. negative conception that we have inherited. And when you look beyond that negative perception, what do you find? What are the characteristics? Why did they embrace Spain? Right. Why did they not want to go off on their own, for instance? Why did they not want to go <laughs> on, off the, on their own? Well, the, interestingly, and this allows me to expand a little more on what's happening in Spain itself. Okay. Because uh, after 1809, the Spanish monarchy entered into a, a huge crisis. Napoleón Bonaparte invades mm -hmm. uh, Madrid and uh, basically uh, takes over the government. And uh, there's a small group of Spanish liberals that move to the south of, of Spain in Cádiz and they start to create uh, you know, an insistent resistance against the, the Napoleonic invasion. Mm -hmm. And they're able to maintain connections with the Spanish uh, American territory that again, here is when they start to really stumble and experiment with uh, autonomy because they realize okay. that the government in Spain is no longer there and, and that leaves a huge space for experimentation. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, this is also a moment when, as I uh, find in my, in my research and writing my book, the people from uh, what we might c call these royalist enclaves or, or bulwarks are going to negotiate their positioning within the monarchy in the new terms in a very open-ended and, and flexible manner because, of course, as I was saying before, as much as uh, the independence project is an open-ended uh, project, the, the, the royalists as well are reinventing what it means to be uh, part of this monarchical system and okay. what it means to be a Spanish vassal. So when you think about indigenous people, to give you another example or more, a more concrete example, people are really trying to think about uh, how to negotiate uh, taxes, for example, mm -hmm. or how to negotiate uh, community, you know, who has authority to do what and on what terms. Of course, military relations here play a huge role. Right. Uh, when you think about slaves, of course, freedom becomes a huge element of negotiation. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not simply freedom in, in a vacuum, or it's not freedom like we tend to think about it like as, a, as an abstract value, but it really is freedom constructed within these monarchical um, relations and negotiating in terms of what it means to be part uh, of the monarchy according to what they need to have. And I actually, I should clarify that these are slaves that are working mostly in the Pacific region of mm -hmm. uh, New Granada. So uh, the, the work really does have like uh, two different landscapes in which this uh, war is taking place. The Andean region where most of the indigenous people are mm -hmm. and the Pacific lowlands okay. where most of the people of African descent, free and enslaved are okay. living. And then um, lastly, what do you conclude in your book? So there's a couple of things, and I think as I introduced uh, the whole project, uh, this is cl clearly uh, a, a work that illustrates the importance of uh, moving away from conceptual 
uh, very rigid categories, uh, for example, to move away from dichotomies between uh, reactionary and uh, revolutionary, mm -hmm. because uh, the, the, the work really allows me to, to uh, redefine what it means to be political in this period and uh, to think in a more open-ended way about uh, the politics of indigenous people uh, and people of African descent. Uh, regarding the broader context, for example, of the Age of Revolution history, mm -hmm. uh, it's important to remind uh, ourselves that, for the most part, the history of the Age of Revolutions has been written from a North Atlantic perspective, and so we know a mm -hmm. lot about, you know, U U.S. Uh, Revolution, and we also know a lot about the Haitian Revolution, and these are stories that really do tend to privilege the, 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 the uh, revolutionary trope uh, and that fit really well with this idea of radical breaks. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that if we move into this Pacific and Dian region, which is where I am focusing my study, we really gain a lot in understanding the complexity and the diversity of the politics of people, of course, from all classes. Uh, and so in that sense, for example, the, the Latin American case really adds um, our understanding of breaking away from, again, from the dichotomies that we're so used to, that liberalism and royalism in the Latin American case and in the case that I study mm -hmm. are not necessarily opposites, for example, mm -hmm. because uh, as I was telling you, the, the liberal project that evolves in the Spanish, um, in the Spanish Peninsula is eventually going to be crucial for the way in which uh, royalist, uh, let's say, um, loyalties are going to be redefined mm -hmm. during this period. So ultimately, people are thinking about uh, a, a loyalty to the crown that is, in, in, in a large extent, liberal. Mm -hmm. And these are things that people don't necessarily put together right. uh, very often when they think about mm -hmm. Uh, the history of this period. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing some of your work. Thank you. For more information about Professor Echeverry and her work, please visit our website at yale.edu slash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.